but Churchill believed it was premature and would be a disaster against the heavily defended French coast. In August 1942, he flew to Moscow to tell Stalin the invasion had to be delayed. It was an epic, dangerous journey. Some 40 hours flying in a stripped-out American bomber via Gibraltar, Cairo and Tehran in four long overnight stretches. His first steps on Russian soil came with a Chichilian rallying cry. We will continue hand in hand like comrades and brothers until every vestige of the Nazi regime has been beaten into the ground. General Alan Brooke, the British Chief of Staff, accompanied Churchill. He recorded this first ever face-to-face -face meeting of any of the other warlords with Stalin. August the 13th, 1942. The two leaders, Churchill and Stalin, are poles apart as human beings. And I cannot see a friendship between them, such as exists between Roosevelt and Winston. Stalin is a realist, with little flattery about him. Facts only count with him. Plans, hypotheses, future possibilities mean little. At their first meeting, Churchill said the invasion of France must be postponed till 1943. He then projected a vision of his alternative plan. He told Stalin that first the Allies would land in the northwest of Africa and drive the Germans out. Then he drew a map in the shape of a crocodile. The hard snout, he explained, was the heavily defended coast of France. Churchill said that rather than invade there, he wanted to attack Hitler in what he called the soft underbelly of Europe, the Adriatic and the Balkans. Stalin questioned him curtly, but politely. The next day, Stalin's mood turned vicious. He accused the British of cowardice. You British are too afraid to fight the Germans. If you tried it like us Russians, you would not find it so bad. Churchill reacted with eloquent fury. I have come all round Europe in the midst of my troubles. Yes, Mr. Stalin, I have my troubles as well as you, hoping to meet the hand of comradeship. And I am bitterly disappointed. I have not that hand. Later that night, Churchill told his staff he would leave Moscow forthwith. But Stalin had been impressed by Churchill's passion, and on the third night, a banquet at the Kremlin broke the ice. From the beginning, vodka flowed freely and one's glass kept being filled up. The tables groaned under every description of hors d'oeuvre and fish, etc. Molotov was opposite Stalin and started proposing toasts within five minutes of our having sat down. These toasts went on continuously. By the end of the dinner, Stalin was quite lively. Walking around the table to click glasses with various people he was proposing the health of. He is an outstanding man, there is no doubt about that, but not an attractive one. Whenever I look at him, I can imagine his sending off people to their doom without ever turning a hair. During the dinner, Churchill made an aside that Stalin was a peasant whom he could handle. His aides were horrified and later, back in his room, warned him the Russians were bugging everything. Churchill said very loudly, The Russians, I have been told, are not human beings at all. They are lower in the scale of nature than the orang utang Now then, let them take that down and translate it into Russian. At times, it had been touch and go, but by the end of the visit, goodwill had broken out. PM was somewhat late, and no wonder. He went to see Stalin for final visit at 7 p.m., and remained with him until 3 a.m. He had no time for bed, and after a bath, came straight to the aerodrome. The band played the Internationale, God Save the King, and the Star Spangled Banner, during which period we all stood to attention and saluted.
As Churchill returned to his war-torn country, he believed he had at least established a working relationship with Stalin. He wrote to Roosevelt, On the whole, I am definitely encouraged by my visit to Moscow. Now they know the worst, and having made their protest, are entirely friendly. But just two months later, an extraordinary message from Stalin to his ambassador in London showed that Churchill's optimism was illusory. Stalin remained deeply suspicious of what he saw as Britain's lack of military support and repeated his long-held fears of Churchill's secret motives. We in Moscow get the impression that Churchill is aiming at the ultimate defeat of the Soviet Union in order then to come to some agreement with Germany at the expense of our country. Stalin even suggested that Churchill was intending to use Hitler's deputy, Rudolf Hess, who was in British captivity, as a negotiating lever with the Nazis. In the coming months, military success pushed political suspicion for a while to one side. Rommel was beaten at the Battle of El Alamein. The Americans and British landed successfully in the northwest of Africa. The Russians defeated the Germans at Stalingrad. Military success was bringing the post-war world nearer. Then, in April 1943, a shocking discovery put the shape of that world into sharp relief. Germany announced that the bodies of thousands of Polish officers had been found in Katyn Forest, shot by the Russians in the spring of 1940. Moscow angrily rejected the claims as Nazi propaganda. But at a private lunch, Churchill said, Alas, the German revelations are probably true. The Bolsheviks can be very cruel. Katyn had a devastating series of knock-on effects. The London-based Polish government in exile, the government for which Britain had gone to war, suspected the Russians were guilty and demanded an investigation by the International Red Cross. Stalin said the demand by the London Poles was a hostile act against the Soviet Union. He already disliked them as they stood for a free and independent Poland. He now used the row over Katyn as an excuse to break off relations with them. Churchill was caught between his loyalty to the London Poles and his wish to preserve good relations with Stalin. In Washington, Roosevelt sensed the tension Katyn was creating. He secretly decided it was time that he, rather than Churchill, became the prime mover in the relationship with the Soviet leader. On May the 5th, 1943, he wrote Stalin a private letter, asking for an informal one-to-one -one get together. The only question was where. Iceland I do not like, because for both you and me it involves rather risky flights, and in addition would make it quite frankly difficult not to invite Prime Minister Churchill at the same time. Therefore I suggest that we could meet either on your side or my side of the Bering Straits. <laughs> 